Aerodynamics is a defunct roller coaster manufacturer known for their revolutionary designs. Whether it be their tubular steel coasters, inverting coasters, mine train coasters, the list only goes on. Unfortunately, Aerodynamics is no longer around with us, but their legacy has left behind many classic rides that coaster enthusiasts like myself cherish greatly. In today's video, I will be taking my 15 favorite Aerodynamics roller coasters and I will rank them from worst to best. Of course, I have not been on every Aero coaster, but I have had the chance to do most of the better ones. Still, there are plenty even in the United States that deserve their own honorable mentions. Kings Island's Adventure Express and Defunct Vortex are two relevant Aero coasters of varying intensities. Both are regarded as some of the best rides of their kind, so I wouldn't be surprised if they could have made this list. Desperado at Buffalo Bills and Dragon Mountain at Marineland are two unique large-scale roller coasters that are currently standing but not operating. I hope to one day ride both of them, but for the time being there's no possible way for me to do so. Demon at California's Great America and Six Flags Great America are two classic looping coasters that are similar to many rides I have ridden, but for some reason I hear these are better than the others. The same thing could be said about Viper at Six Flags Darien Lake, which I guess looks fun, but strangely enough it gets a lot of love. But the biggest honorable mentions in the United States reside at Elitch Gardens and Frontier City in Sidewinder and Diamondback. These two shuttle loop coasters are very unique but are pretty hard to come by. Lastly, there are some noteworthy rides overseas that could have potentially cracked this list. Big One at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, Revolution at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, Diablo at Port Aventura, and lastly Rolling X Train and Fantasy Special in South Korea had their own potential. Other than these many exceptions, I do have some pretty cool aerodynamics coasters under my belt. So without further ado, these are the top 15 aero coasters I've had the chance to ride. Number 15, Runaway Mine Train at Six Flags Over Texas. Going in, I was expecting a pretty ordinary mine train from this ride. Just the appearance, the name, and the look of it, it all came together and gave me that vibe. But after one ride, I was proven wrong by its long and fun layout. Runaway Mine Train was actually the first ride of its kind when it opened in 1966, and I find it really impressive that it's one of the best still. It's got three lift hills, many tunnels, a great finale, and overall, it's a family coaster that all ages will like. Number 14, Corkscrew at Silverwood. I've ridden many other Corkscrew coasters in North America, like the one at Cedar Point, Valley Fair, and etc. But while this version is a bit shorter than those, I find it to be better due to its maintenance. Silverwood has been keeping this thing in great shape, and I think that's really commendable when you consider its history. The ride originally opened in 1975 at Knott's Berry Farm in California, and it actually became the first modern day roller coaster to take riders upside down. But when Knott's decided it was time to say farewell to the attraction, Silverwood came in and saved the ride. And they didn't just save it from being defunct, they are treating it like it deserves to be treated. It's one of the smoothest era looping coasters I've done, which is just awesome, even if it is a simple layout. So while I can't say Corkscrew's ride experience will impress you all too much, its historical significance and smoothness sure will. Number 13, Roadrunner Express at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. One of the most creative mine train coasters out there was also the most recent one, opening in 1997. The ride was designed by our lord and savior Alan Schilke, so when you consider this, it starts to make sense why an average family coaster turned out to be a genuinely awesome ride. It's a relatively smooth coaster for its age, it has some decent forces, and its terrain usage hugging the park's quarry wall is fantastic. For such a basic ride model, I think Aerodynamics did the absolute best they could with Roadrunner Express. Number 12, Ninja at Six Flags Magic Mountain. While Ninja isn't the best suspended coaster I've ridden, it's actually not far from it. I guess I was always expecting it to be a landslide loss, but this isn't the case at all. Ninja is always better than I remember after each ride, and I think that mostly has to do with this layout. The way it hugs the side of the mountain and swoops its way down it is great, and it's something that can easily be taken for granted with all the other coasters in this park that do something similar. Ninja definitely isn't the most intense ride in the world, but I think it's underrated for its purely fun and zippy ride experience. Number 11, Thunderation at Silver Dollar City. The best aero mine train coaster I've had the chance to ride is also the most intense I've ever seen. It might be easy to call this ride a family coaster had you not ridden it, but once you give it a shot, you may be pleasantly surprised. Its turns and helixes pull some shocking positive g-forces, and its pacing is exceptional for its ride type. Plus, it's a terrain coaster, which definitely helps it maintain its speed beautifully until the end. That is, until you reach the end and you climb up a large lift hill and the ride actually ends out on its very own bang. It's not something I was expecting going in, but it has the largest drop of the coaster at the very end of the ride, and that's what takes you up into the brake run. Now, if there is one thing you should look out for, Thunderation is not the smoothest ride in my opinion, but I think that's entirely due to the ride's intensity, which in my opinion is totally a fair trade-off. Number 10, Vortex at Canada's Wonderland. For those of you who have ridden this ride's mirror clone, Bad at King's Island, that can also apply here and is actually why I didn't give that ride its own honorable mention. But since I have not had the chance to visit this park yet, that's actually fine in this case because I've ridden an identical ride in Canada. Vortex is a bit shorter than I was expecting, but it really hugs the ground and utilizes great pacing. Its speed and sway is awesome and immediately had me understanding why people regard this and Bat so highly. It's a super fun ride for what it is and I think it's one of the better roller coasters in the park. 
Number nine, Loch Ness Monster at Busch Gardens, Williamsburg. Come on, you've definitely heard of this ride before. Everyone just loves Loch Ness Monster for some reason. Before riding, I didn't really understand, but I gained a new appreciation for it after riding. I mean, this goes for most roller coasters to be fair, but Loch Ness Monster was a special example. Its vintage feel really throws me for a loop. And speaking of, the world's only interlocking loops can be found on this ride and are the perfect cherry on top for this coaster. Outside the loops, it has just a weird layout too. It does a lot of meandering, but in a really fun way. For example, look at this weird triple helix in a tunnel. That really just caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting it. Loch Ness Monster isn't one of the standout attractions at Busch Gardens. However, for its age of 43 years old, it's held up awesome over time. Number eight, Gemini at Cedar Point. Speaking of classic coasters that everyone seems to love, Gemini is a ride that either gets overshadowed at this park or it gets an overwhelming amount of love. I definitely see both sides myself, but when it really comes down to it, it doesn't get much more fun than Gemini. It's a ride that's been maintained fantastic. It's smooth, it gives good airtime, it duels another train. Like, come on, this thing's just awesome. Its ride model is also known as a special coaster system design, which I don't really know what it means. I think it just probably means that it doesn't fit the criteria of any other model from the manufacturer. With that said, there are two other rides that fit this outlying design, and they are actually the following two coasters on this list. So cue the number seven and six spots. Number seven, Matterhorn Bobsleds at Disneyland. This ride was the pioneer for modern day roller coasters as we know it. Matterhorn opened in 1959 as the first ever tubular steel roller coaster, which earned itself an ace landmark in highly regarded history. But not only is it a historical coaster, it actually rides fantastic. Of course, it is janky as hell, but that's part of the fun of Matterhorn. It feels so close to a NASA trip for a coaster as you snake your way down the Matterhorn mountain of Disneyland. Particularly, this coaster is split up into two sides, one facing Fantasyland and one facing Tomorrowland, and the latter is crazy. Its dips give abrupt pops of airtime, and its turns give uncomfortable moments of lateral Gs in the best way possible. So in conclusion, Matterhorn is a prime example of a coaster you've gotta love for its history, but just as much so, you've gotta love it for its fast-paced ride experience. Number six, Excalibur at Valley Fair. When planning my trip to Minnesota this past September, I went in with the expectation that I would unfortunately miss out on Excalibur. The ride is supposedly closed for the season due to staffing and because it just usually doesn't run during the park's Halloween season. But just before the trip started, I got news that Valley Fair had gotten a bunch of new staff from Schlitterbahn down in Texas and therefore were planning to run Excalibur for the rest of the year. Despite this, we spent the first few hours of our day with a pit in our stomach as Excalibur was the one ride we hadn't seen gone up its lift hill. Plus, when we asked a ride operator in the station for High Roller, she said that the rumors weren't true and that she was almost sure it would be closed for the season. But would you look at that, we come off High Roller and we see a train go up its lift hill out in the distance. At that point, we stopped what we were doing and ran halfway across the park to check it out. Now, I realize that I haven't talked at all about the ride experience yet, so sorry about that. I just love sharing our experience of anxiety and anticipation with this ride. But once we did finally get to the ride, we came up with our expectations exceeded. I had expected a great ride all along, don't get me wrong, but it is exactly what I'm looking for in a good aero coaster. It's a janky mess of a ride, but has some down right violent airtime laterals and positive Gs. Literally, all three of these sensations are exactly what you want to see on any roller coaster, but on a classic 1989 mine train on steroids, it's something to really appreciate. Anyways, I'm going to wrap this up since this segment about Excalibur has been going on for far too long, but this coaster is just loads of fun for all the wrong reasons, and if you can, I would highly recommend giving it a ride. Number five, Viper at Six Flags Magic Mountain. From here on out, we really get to the rides that I just love so much. Viper resides at one of my home parks in Six Flags Magic Mountain, but despite me riding it all the time, I can never get enough of it. Once upon a time, it actually was one of my least favorite coasters anywhere, but something happened to it post-2018 where it just changed for the better. It became remarkably smooth for an aero coaster, and it has a great huge layout. Its first half is taken at a rapid pace with many inversions that'll cause you to gray out. Then the mid-course brake run slows the train down to a near haul and brings some unexpected hang time to the table. It's a great mix match of sensations that you would never expect from a ride like this, but for that alone, I have a soft spot in my heart for Viper. Number four, Canyon Blaster at the Adventure Dome. Possibly the most underrated aero looper I've had the pleasure of riding is also the best roller coaster in the entirety of Nevada. It may not look like much from the outside or judging by the stats, especially since it's similar to many other aero coasters, but something about this one, whether it's the year-round operations, indoor conditions, whatever it is, just force it to fly through its layout. Its inversions, while ordinary in appearance, are taken at a wicked pace, making them uber intense and extremely disorienting. Again, it might be hard to believe that such a simple ride can be this good, but Canyon Blaster is another breed of an aero. Absolutely one of the best aero loopers out there. Number three, Tennessee Tornado at Dollywood. For some odd reason, I had a feeling I'd be disappointed by this ride because of its short length and its large inversions, which I figured before riding that it would take away from strong forces. But oh man, was I wrong. This ride is crazy. Every single time I rode it, I found myself graying out to an extent close to a blackout. It is just beyond intense. There is no denying that it is over before you know it and that it does feel as short as I feared, but the more I ride coasters like this that are short but have no dead spots, the more I really don't mind short length. Tennessee Tornado just hauls ass till the final brake run, and in addition, it's a very smooth ride. It truly is as good as its reputation suggests, and I should have never doubted the ride. 
Number two, Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point. To be honest, I was tempted to put this ride a little bit lower on the list, but I know I'd get extreme amounts of hate. Besides, the more I thought about it, the more I recognized how spectacular the second half of this ride is. Magnum XL200 was the first full circuit traditional hyper coaster when it opened in 1989, which is a term used to describe any full circuit coaster that stands 200 to 299 feet tall. The first half of this ride is filled with large scale hills with the middle section being a turnaround, which to be honest, I really don't enjoy, but then the ending is excellent. At that point, the endless series of triangle shaped hills that absolutely launch you out of your seat are to die for. The only problem with this ride is the rest of it isn't super great in my opinion. It's not like it's that rough, it's just not the most entertaining and a lot of the elements tend to be pretty jank and just don't really do anything for me. Nonetheless, it's a significant piece of roller coaster history and again, that second half is spectacular. I think that alone gives Magnum its fair shake at the number two spot, but if you are one of those people who thinks it's even close to being number one, just no, I seriously disagree. Number 1, X2 at Six Flags Magic Mountain. The very last roller coaster that Aerodynamics ever built was one that flipped the coaster industry on its head, literally. At first, the company had proposed a fourth dimension design layout to the park, but they were quick to be turned down as they were looking for something bigger. But Magic Mountain did love the idea of flipping riders 360 degrees in their seats, hence the 4D design. So Aero got back to them with the menacing X2, then known as X. Throughout the ride's early years, it would end up costing 55 million US dollars to initially construct, then modify since it was a prototype, and then upgrade in 2008 to X2. This was well over the proposed cost and resources, which thus cost aerodynamics to go out of business. So X2, this very ride, as incredible as it is, is what caused the most influential roller coaster manufacturer ever to go defunct. But what a ride they left behind, X2 is truly one of the most intense rides on earth. It's amazing to me that it's able to throw people around at no mercy and is even capable of what it's able to do. This is especially true for its time, opening in 2002, which isn't ridiculously early, but it's no wonder why it was a prototype, Aero went with something that no one else had ever attempted before. So trust me, if you haven't ridden it before, let me just give you the disclaimer that X2 is not for the faint of heart, but there's a damn good reason it's one of the best roller coasters I've ever been on. The legacy of aerodynamics is something that should never be forgotten amongst coaster enthusiasts. As you've likely discovered by now, they have been responsible for so many world's first attractions, so many record breakers, so many ambitious projects, and that's just something I love looking back on. These 15 rides from what I've had the chance to ride are the best of what they've left behind, and I hope you all get the chance to ride through coaster history and all of them. But hey, I'd love to see how you rank your favorite aero coasters down in the comments because there are some damn good stuff that they've done. Also, if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel, that would be greatly appreciated, guys. But with that being said, I hope you all enjoyed, and I'll see you very soon. Bye. Bye everyone.